my hands, but you know my choice. I'm the one here. So here's how it goes. So what are we going to discuss today? What the overall objective of that this fragment you're seeing is enabling solar PV. And the fragment that you're seeing is related to the fact that solar is intermittent, as is wind. In fact, there is no renewable energy that's not intermittent. Intermittent meaning it's not 24-7. Intermittent is got to be filled up. By what? So there are two types of intermittencies that solar and wind have, and well, solar in particular. Let's, let's talk about solar because that's what this is. Um, one is what we call the famous four to six hours. The late evening hours, there's no sun, but there's need. Okay, and so that is usually covered electrochemically. We're not going to discuss that today. Okay, uh, that's the bottom left of the original mind map. Why are we not discussing today? There's only so much we can discuss in this period of time. So what we are going to discuss today is the longer term, the monsoon season, rainy days and all that. I get the statistic that's interesting to make the point, which is that Germany has 40% renewable, but on any given day it's 15 or 70. Okay, when you get that kind of variability, you're nailed. If you don't have the storage problem solved, you're done. So this part, this upper right part is is storage, in a, it's not exactly storage, it's augmentation. It is the upper right part, basically, it is, here, here's a fact. Solar energy backup for the rainy days, over 90% is from fossil fuel, okay? And most of that fossil fuel is natural gas if you got it. India doesn't have a lot of natural gas. India's natural gas is mostly imported through liquefied natural gas, LNG, and that's dreadful. The price is high, and you're relying on other people for imports. This entire right, upper right part, this fragment we're discussing today, is how do you do that without imported gas? Now, we're not going to get into that broad breadth, because if you don't narrow it down, it's not a, it's not a, a neat discussion. So, so what we decided to do, a few of us who were organizing this thing, uh, decided to narrow it down. Now we can broaden it out if after we, the narrow discussion proves to be done, so to speak. Done meaning we're getting bored by this time. And if we do, then we'll do a new one which is broader. But today we decided to do something, a question, which is, a, is being faced by a lot of countries right now and by the government of India. What is that question? What is the place of hydrogen in all of this, okay? And there's a lot of statements made, a lot of positions taken, but not a lot of knowledge, okay? So you folks here are going to develop that knowledge, some today, and some when you take off and do other things. But I'm gonna start with hydrogen has different colors. So this discussion is going to be, what color is your hydrogen? It sounds almost like a, TV show, but it's not, okay? And so what, what's the meaning of color? G hydrogen normally is produced, oh, I don't know, 90 plus percent of hydrogen is produced through steam methane reforming. This is where you take methane reacted with steam under, under certain conditions, and you get hydrogen plus CO2. And the CO2, if you do nothing but use that hydrogen, I believe it's gray. Okay, uh, he's saying yes, Nikhil says yes, so it's great. If you take the CO2 and sequester, by the way, sequester is, a, the English word sequester means put it away. The science word sequester means catch it and put it away, okay? So sequestration is actually capture and storage. But anyway, regardless of that. So if you sequester the CO2 during steam methane reforming, then the hydrogen produced is called blue. And then there's green. Green would be if you electrolyze water. I'm not aware of any other, other approach that, okay, so, okay, turquoise, okay. <laughs> okay, so what, what, so what, is, what is turquoise exactly? I, Example. Uh, so when you use from nuclear sources the energy to basically 
capture the CO2 part, then it becomes purple or purple. I, don't know. I, think, I think it's purple. I think it's purple. Uh, you see, okay, this is exactly the way it should go. This is exactly the way this discussion should go. Anything I say should be challenged, or not, should be challenged, can be challenged, okay? Besides, I'm going to stop saying things pretty soon because we're going to have to pick this up, okay? But, what's that? Uh, this is always a troublemaker in the group, okay? If you don't have a troublemaker, then it's axiomatically the troublemaker. Okay, so green, blue, other shades of purple or turquoise, what is the appropriate color? This is the discussion at hand, okay? And I'm telling you, so in other words, put it another way. I don't think it's practical to go all green, okay? Uh, you don't have enough renewable energy to satisfy other demands to run industry. How are you going to use it all to make hydrogen, okay? So I don't think it's practical. So I think let's open this up now to any, ang any angle you have on this question. The question that is being posed is, what color should your hydrogen be? Okay, so let's go with anybody saying whatsoever. So, see, the energy, if it is not coming from a renewable source and you're electrolyzing, then it's blue hydrogen because you're getting it from some other source which may not be green. As such. So there's one more color to add to the turquoise. Okay, uh, who's going to build on that comment? He said if the energy source to produce the electrolytic hydrogen is not renewable, then it is what? Blue. Blue, yeah, that's right. So he's got another construct on the blue, uh, which is you electrolyze water, produce hydrogen, that's cool. But the electricity used was not renewable, so it's called blue. He's giving an, another example of blue than I gave. I gave you the blue example. I guess what you did is the right uh, explanation of blue hydrogen. If you ask if you stick the CO2 from the gray hydrogen, it becomes blue. Uh, but any other source of energy other than uh, fossil fuel, I guess they give different colors. And nuclear energy is the purple color, and someone talked about yellow color as well. So I don't remember exactly, but yeah, there are other colors. But blue is uh, always. Uh, Green uh, will become blue. Basically, sequester the CO2, and probably that is in India. One of the best way of doing it would be to basically use your coals. So whatever coal you have, you are employing huge amount of manpower, roughly two and a half lakhs people in coal in uh, coal fields. So you need to bother about their uh, livelihood and all. So that is one reason why you would like to go to coal to uh, hydrogen. And as uh, Dr. Rao has already said, that you can gasify and do water gas reaction to produce CO2 and hydrogen. Sequester the CO2, and the hydrogen you get is blue hydrogen. This is kind of most uh, practical at this point of time. This is my uh, personal belief. First here and then there. I, I think we are putting the cart before the horse here. So we first have to figure out, do we need to use hydrogen and the question is, what color? I didn't, uh, the question should have been, would you use hydrogen and what would you use it for? Because color can be decided later. We started using electricity, and now we are figuring out what electricity. Uh, I mean, had there been no need for electricity, we would not even be talking about renewable electricity. So I think the question is just... Uh, okay, before we go to your one, I will not forget you. Let's build on that point, okay? What are you going to do with the hydrogen? Go ahead, Rajesh. By the way, you get you get about three or four shots, and the other people yeah. are speaking. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so see, the problem uh, here is that we are talking about CO2 utilization and many other things. So hydrogen is the raw material. You you talk about CO2 utilization, and there is no other way you can utilize CO2 if you don't add hydrogen to it. So hydrogen is the central theme. Talk about producing electricity out of hydrogen. Talk, hydrogen. Talk about producing other chemicals of, uh, out of hydrogen. But see, hydrogen is required. Now, one may argue uh, whether you have, when you are mixing hydrogen, which is a high value product, with CO2, which is a low value product, either you are actually utilizing CO2 or utilizing hydrogen. So I would say it's utilization of hydrogen because you don't know how to transport your hydrogen, add carbon to it so that the weight increases significantly. Either you can liquefy it or you can do whatever. So basically, it's way of saying that we are trying to utilize the uses of hydrogen because right now we really don't know how to transport hydrogen economically. 
So somehow you add carbon into it and then you uh, basically make sure that you can transport. Okay, I'm going to take that one, but I want to build on what he just said. Somebody should question his statement. Vikru, can I have people do this poll as well? Just 10 second instruction on the poll that you see. Only one person has voted on what color hydrogen would you use and that person has told us they don't care. <laughs> A little bit sad about it. So either you can point your, if you're close enough, point to the QR code or it's lido.com and some number I can't read, but I hope you can. And you can vote. You can point it from anywhere or go in slido.com and 624049 is the code. Thank you. This is a professor of Preeti Special. She wants you to do these things. Just do it. Otherwise, she'll keep bugging you. Okay. Okay. So I will take that. I'll take, you had a hand up there, but. Yes. Yeah. The other source for hydrogen is biomass, right? You have everything neatly arranged out there. You convert it into syngas and then you can do anything you want to do with it. So it's not really necessary. You need hydrogen as hydrogen to do whatever you want. Whatever you want from hydrogen and CO2 together, you can do. I mean, you already have it as CO and H2 in syngas. Okay. So what he just said, I'm, I'm not forgotten you and nor have I forgotten you, okay? Uh, what he just said was that you can produce uh, syngas, which is carbon monoxide plus hydrogen, from any carbonaceous material, and he's saying from, uh, from biomass, and then, of course, shift react it, which we all know what that means, uh, well, I hope you do, uh, uh, to hydrogen and CO2, and then capture the CO2. Yeah, that's right. And at that point, geez, it's getting pretty greenish, but I'm not sure what the color is. Yeah. But you're not answering Satya's question, which is what do you do with the hydrogen? You're still talking about producing it. So someone pick up on what should, wh why should we, what should we do with the hydrogen? Did you have your hand up or you're, do you're done? Okay, no. You do. What? No? Why? Because Priti made you fill out these things? Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Uh, so I would like to question, uh, like, counter Rajneesh, sir, at least. Uh, That's so, good. Yeah. So he said uh, we can sequester uh, carbon and, uh, sorry, hydrogen. We can get hydrogen, then mix with uh, carbon. Again, we are making methane. So we are, what we had before, and we are making it again. What's the use of it? You know, the... Uh, by the way. Oh, sorry. So I am just saying that we are not, I am not proposing that we should mix hydrogen and uh, CO2. That's uh, what I am trying to say that that is one way of looking at it. If you have hydrogen, I, my personal opinion is that why you would mix it with CO2 and reduce the value. But the point is that if uh, you really want to use hydrogen, then you have to also transport it. And right now we really don't know much about transportation other than talking about 700 bar operators. Uh, I agree, but at the same time you could find ways to transport it, like work on, like finding ways to transport so it rather than... we are here. Okay. I'm just saying right now the technology is not there to transport so hydrogen. I, I'm not density. clear on uh, this. Okay, right there. I, I, I would like you to do is address the question of hydrogen transport. If you want to do something else, I'll come back to you. I don't want to... Yeah, because go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to uh, talk about hydrogen, but I don't. I want to. Uh, I want to counter that. Why the why hydrogen? Because someone asked me that where you are using hydrogen. I don't think that life exists without hydrogen. Because whatever our life is basis are on anything. Carbo carbohydrates are the basic, and hydrogen is most part of carbohydrates and every living form is based on hydrogen. If you take our plastics... Uh, okay, I'm coming to you. Yeah, if you take, finish? If you take from plastics to whatever, whatnot, from fuels, everything is based on hydrogen only. So the main source of hydrogen is very important. And you, you have numerous uses of hydrogen. Okay, uh, Satya. Yeah, I mean... It's easy to say life depends on hydrogen, so does life depend on carbon. So now we are talking about zero carbon, carbon, all of that. That's not the argument here. The argument here is that we doing all of this to use hydrogen, but have we figured out ways to use hydrogen? So the question here is, do we really care about the color of hydrogen? At this point in time, I think we should not, because we have not yet developed 
uses of hydrogen. I'll go back to my earlier point about electricity, where when we started using electricity, we did not care about the color of electricity. If we were to give color electricity, now we call green electricity, which, uh, which was not there maybe a couple of decades ago. So I think kind of looking at it in a similar way might help. You got it. Press once. If you press twice, it goes away. I think uh, I thought it helps it works. It my name is Amina. I'm part of Shell. And I think we should be uh, very, very keenly uh, uh, aware of or know what our source of hydrogen is and hydrogen is and what color it is. Because if you're going to make the same mistake again here, we will probably come back again to kind of think about to, uh, should we have done this at this first stage itself. So I think green hydrogen would probably be the best if you cannot under no circumstances, if the cost doesn't uh, work out or whatever, then probably we'll probably go to a lighter color or whatever different color. But at least let's not uh, ignore the color of uh, hydrogen, because that again will again create another problem which will again try to solve it. Okay, so, so can I counter that, please? Yes, certainly. Raise your hand okay, so I yeah, can see okay, you. Yeah, okay. He can't see me, so here. Um, yeah, so a uh, couple of points here. One is about this color of hydrogen debate, and the other one is about the transport. The easier one to uh, say is talk about the transport. Hydrogen, I've, you know, for those who are familiar with uh, Toyota's experiment with Mirai in California, they are transporting. Yes, it's liquid hydrogen. Uh, it's being transported. So I don't think it's a, there's a cost issue. There's a difference between saying we don't know how to transport hydrogen and saying it is costly to transport. That, that's completely two different things. We know how to transport hydrogen. So I want to be very clear that, but it's just that the cost has to be worked out and made economical. Okay, let's put, it, put that away. Coming back to the color of hydrogen, the, uh, there is, you have to take a fundamental step back in terms of carbon, capturing carbon, carbon zero, net zero, all these kind of things. I give you two choices of world scenarios. You tell me which one you can easily handle in terms of you know, reducing the carbon footprint. I give you centralized, large-scale carbon emitters, such as power stations, cement manufacturing plant, and so on and so forth. Or I give you a zillion small points of carbon emission, your auto rickshaws, your cars, your you know, everything running around. Tell me which scenario you will be able to, from a technology perspective, you will be able to address. Which, po which problem would you like to uh, handle from a policy perspective, technology perspective, all of these angles? My view here, there was a rhetorical question, I don't want any of you to answer. My view here was, is that it is easier to capture the carbon emitted in the large centralized units instead of these millions and millions of vehicles running around and you trying to convince every single driver that he has to spend more money to have some way of capturing the carbon. Therefore, it is important that we switch all these end user micro points of carbon generation, get rid of them, whatever it is, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, purple hydrogen, I don't care how many colors you use, just get rid of them, whether it's lithium ion or hydrogen, whatever it is. Move the burden to the big central units where the cost and the way you can scale up the technology can bring economics much, much faster. So that's the idea I would propose on the table for this discussion. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to take that question I'm, I'm and come to you. I uh, disagree with this. You may, I mean, I will probably, that, those are the low-hanging fruits you can probably tackle faster, but without uh, vehicle pollution, look at Delhi. I mean, probably half of the people are suffering because of uh, I mean, pollutions because of vehicles. So you can't uh, leave one set of it and you can just tackle one set and then say that I'm doing good. The pollution coming out from steel industry, cement industries are all way outside most of the cities, except for maybe some power plants which are now into. So you can tackle that. Those are low hanging fruit. Those are the easiest to do that. Correct. That is perfect. But you cannot also leave the millions of vehicles out. You, if you don't want to do it at a uh, at a company level, do it at a legislation level. Uh, I think you're saying exactly what I said. Because so, you're saying that we need to move good. all the vehicles to the single thing as a first step because it's much easier by policy to control uh, and also from technology to control the big because you can scale up huge solutions for these industries. Right. For the cars, the individual affordability, that's a very different challenge. You're playing with 
convincing billions of people on earth. At the policy level, if you do it, you don't need to convince. I mean, if it is, it is. You can't just change the policy level. I mean, if I'm getting bad food at a hotel, I'll probably shut down the hotel rather than going there or asking people to eat. So if I'm selling a bad car, and probably it's better to shut it down. Correct. The okay. policy level works much better in the okay. uh, large that, scale. That one's, that one's done. Yeah. That one's done. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Vibhu. Uh, you can be closer. I worked at Tata Steel Limited and the, the place where one of the projects, most ambitious one, is to produce the green hydrogen in, to add as a fuel in the blast furnace. Because in steel production, a lot of, th and the most important thing is the color. We, we choose to go with the green hydrogen because all the other, the carbon capture and all, it doesn't work as fine with the steel industry. So that in, in, in view of the steel industry, the green, the green hydrogen is the most used. Okay, so I would like to uh, come back to green steel because it's an important area and build on that point. And I would like to make one comment on what Vasu said. Basically summarizing what Vasu said in shorter space of time, uh, it's easier to capture at a big point source rather than small point sources. But I'll tell you, he previously said, let's not look at economics, is it even feasible? I will tell you, I know of a method of adsorbent desorbing method for capturing at the tailpipe. It was done. It, it, the, the, it, not the cost, it was mostly the logistics, okay? But it can be done, all right? We do that with NOx right now, and we do that with particulate matter in diesel. So it's not impossible to do capture things economically. By the way, the diesel particulates don't work all that well, but this is a different discussion, we won't go there, okay. So it can be done at small point sources, but not preferable, which I agree with you, okay. Um, does somebody want to build on it, Rajneesh's contention that we can't transport hydrogen uh, effectively? Any, anybody wants to do that one? Yes. Great. So, Rajnish, I'm a firm ardent believer of hydrogen economy. So, apparently, I think probably I can counter that. So, I've thought about this issue, and we talked about it yesterday as well. As of now, I think we know how to transport gas, and that's what uh, Mr. Basu also talked about. And, like, we always, we have three options. Either we transport the compressed gas, which we already know how to do. We know how to transport liquid hydrogen. That's been happening for a while. And the third and most important thing we'll have to consider is transport them in the solids. Like hydride minerals are coming up now. And I think that's still in the kind of advanced stage of research and it's in the pilot level. And I think we'll be able to tackle that, the whole hydrogen. People always talk about if you transport in compressed, as a compressed gas or liquid hydrogen, it, it's going to explode. Now I'm saying that there is a third option, which is relatively safer. In fact, the first two are also safer. I think uh, not many explosions happen. And any time when we talk about hydrogen explosion, we go back to the space shuttle. I think, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many uh, things exploded after that. <laughs> but it's, it's, fairly minimal. It's, it's literally nothing. So uh, transport ways, we know how to do it. It's more about the perspective of an individual or, or a set of people thinking that it's unsafe. I think the same problem existed when the gas cylinders came to our houses. Same thing is happening now for electric vehicles, saying that battery is not safe. Thing is that every time we are building up on an advanced technology, we will encounter some un un like un unanticipated troubles, which we'll have to solve one step on and solve the problem completely. Yeah, Rajneesh. Yeah, yeah I am not saying it's unsafe. I said uh, yeah, safety. Uh, I agree that there is no safety problem. We can certainly uh, circumvent that. And also, I am not saying that there is no way we can transport hydrogen. It's all. Uh, my point was that it's quite costly at this point of time. So that's all I wanted to say. Now, talking about liquid hydrogen, I would also say that, yeah, obviously it's easy to do that, but then there is two isomers of hydrogen, one is called ortho, another is para. There is a lot of challenges at uh, really fundamental level, how basically what is the heat of, uh, latent heat of this transformation and all. So those challenges are still there when we talk about transport of liquid hydrogen. Compressed hydrogen is much easier and people are talking about, for example, one of the way of transporting hydrogen is that you mix it with L, uh, CNG pipelines. And at the end, you can basically separate out the hydrogen. So roughly 18 to 20 percent is mixed in CNG pipelines along with CNG. And then if you want just hydrogen, separate out the hydrogen from the CNG and use your hydrogen. So that's, there are ways to transport it, yeah. But we have to up, improvise on those steps so that we can somehow reduce the cost of transportation. 
So I'll take that one, but before I do, let me make one quick comment on this. Uh, in Europe, what they're doing right now is taking fall to electricity, making hydrogen, and they're putting it on pipelines with not CNG, but with, well, it's compressed, I guess, yeah. with, natural, with, with natural gas. But they're doing it only up to 20%, yeah. because uh, it is thought that because hydrogen is a very small molecule and diffuses very readily through, yes, I'll get to you, uh, readily, uh, that 20% is the limit. And then they use that to go back to the question, what do you do with the hydrogen? They use that in burners, okay? And you have to adjust things by 20%, it's fine. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. First there and then there. In terms of hydrogen, I just thought I'll put, put the nickel hydride uh, out there to say that's a third approach where you can store hydrogen as nickel hydride. As he mentioned, it's in the academic stages now, but trust chemists, please come to chemists. Chemists have solutions. And uh, engineers have to actually open their eyes and look at these nickel hydride uh, technology and take it up from there. And then maybe we'll have a better storage system for uh, hydrogen. So let's quickly build on that uh, on the, so in nickel hydride, I, I'm not that familiar. Is this, would it be a, is it a MOF form or is it the whole, the whole no, chemical not change? Moth. Okay. Not MOF, okay. Got it, okay. Uh, no, we go back there somewhere there. There was a hand. No, no hand? Okay, well then, then you're next, Satya. So, uh, like she mentioned, uh, nickel hydride, I would also like to put forward ammonia as a solution. Uh, ammonia has been there, we've known to handle it hundreds of years. It's a benign chemical, though it is toxic and an irritant, but generally a benign chemical. So, why not develop an ammonia economy rather than solely focusing on a hydrogen economy? Let's build on that point because that's not a trivial question, okay? Uh, so what is the ammonia transport, hydrogen transport, you can do it in a pipeline, but, uh, but roughly the, the cost of doing that was roughly five times the cost of transporting ammonia. Now, you can argue that making ammonia means uh, energy to make the ammonia, but people are working on making the ammonia, not the old Haber-Bosch pro process to make it at a lower pressure. Okay, so if you can lower, lower the pressure significantly, things can happen. Okay, so let's just, if anybody knows anything in this space, let's build on that point, which is ammonia transport. Rajin, you got your own. I'm not giving it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll take the, her question about nickel hydride. Obviously, it's a good option, but yeah, regenerating hydrogen from nickel hydride is, has been always a challenge. So, and uh, ammonia sounds to be much better compared to uh, nickel hydride. One of the options here is that you know how to transport ammonia, how to make ammonia, and the infrastructure is already available. So certainly transport of hydrogen in as ammonia makes a lot more sense uh, compared to nickel hydride at this point of time. That's what I wanted to add. If you want something else. Uh, I don't want anything, but this is what you said. <laughs> to, add to, add to your point. Who, who is saying that? No, I'm saying that. To add to your point on manufacture of ammonia, Haber Bosch, I think there are lot more uh, articles and lot more research coming out on making ammonia using electrolytic process and also low pressure, low temperature process, a lot of catalytic processes. So I think it's a worthwhile, uh, at least research endeavor to look at uh, ammonia in a uh, significant way. In fact, I'm gonna make a plug in, in the chemi space for PI, process intensification. Uh, and I think process intensification, well, I know what it is. Basically it is that you improve the kinetics to where uh, a small scale process is nearly as economical as, eco so in other words, you overcome economies of scale, kind of, uh, with, with that. Okay, you had, somebody was pointing there. You, what? you have a mic? Yeah. So, uh, coming to ammonia, production of ammonia, uh, right now, 1% of world's energy is going to make ammonia if we use Haber-Bosch process. So, as we said, low pressure process, process can be used where they use electro conversion using electricity converting uh, hydrogen and nitrogen mix to get ammonia the problem is the catalyst right now so we need to build a uh, good catalyst that can convert this uh, combination of nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia and research is already going on it's in very nascent stage efficiencies are low so same like direct conversion of solar to hydrogen, splitting water and uh, oxygen, uh, sorry, water into oxygen, hydrogen, 
efficiency are the problem. So here also it's the same problem. If you can build a robust catalyst, that can be done at low pressure and low energy. So basically, DOE, Department of Energy US, picks Shell-led consortium to provide LS2 storage technology. So Shell is kind of involved now, along with other partners, to build this LS2 storage technology. No, he is not holding it properly. <laughs> So uh, the pro project has started on the 1st of September, it will be a three years project. So the uh, size or the demo tank size will be somewhere around 20,000 to 100,000 cubic meter. And so I'm, I'm missing the point. What are you do exactly doing? Uh, so, so we are constructing a demonstration uh, ta tank to hold uh, hydrogen for transport. To hold hydrogen for transport. Okay, right now hydrogen is transported as a gas at, at certain pressure or liquid. Which way are you transporting it? Uh, LH2, liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen, okay, fine. All right. Uh, it's, did, being done. Huh? it's being done. Oh, no, liquid hydrogen is being done. In fact, most, uh, okay, uh, for long distance transport, uh, liquid is the way to go. Tube tails for, uh, are really for short distance transport. So if your SMR is in the middle of some country and you've got to go another 2,000 kilometers or something, uh, no tube trailers, no regular gas, you have to liquefy it. But some towns will not allow liquid hydrogen to go through their towns. Uh, now, rightly or wrongly, they won't allow it. In India, you can't. In India, you can't. Okay, so. The policies are that liquid nitro, natural gas or liquid hydrogen cannot be transported through roads. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mukundan. Um, so, on, uh, regarding the transport uh, piece, right, well, let's, let's step back a little bit on understanding what problem we're trying to solve. Right, the problem is basically how to utilize the solar to maximize for use in terms of production of hydrogen, right? Um, and in the transport itself, we're going to cause more pollution. And it, it's not worth it to look at that, in my opinion. If, if you're creating more problems by solving one problem, is not the right, right approach. So if we can focus on areas where hydrogen can be produced in situ and utilized, uh, like the steel industry, cement industry, that's the right approach for hydrogen, in my opinion. In the interim, while the R&D is getting developed for transportation, using EVs, hydrogen fuel vehicles, I don't know, right? So until that is there, don't create more problems. Okay, so let's build on that or challenge that assertion. The assertion basically is produce hydrogen with fall through electricity, fine, but use it locally. Do not make an entire system for it. Does anybody want to challenge that? No, I didn't say fall through electricity. Use, use solar to produce the hydrogen. Okay. In situ and use it. What do you mean in situ? Okay, okay. By taking the mountain to Muhammad. Okay, I get it. Okay. Uh, all right, that's what he's saying. But you're still saying that you don't, you don't feel there should be a hydrogen economy, a hydrogen infrastructure. Is that what you say? Do people agree with that? Does any? Oh, sorry, I can't even look. I said this thing is hiding me. Uh, I'm so glad. My spotters, why didn't my spotters tell me? Oh, you are. Okay. So, hello, everyone. I would actually uh, like to add to that point. So with regard to in situ hydrogen production, uh, which is basically onboard hydrogen production, uh, right now research is especially going on with regard to the automobile industry. So what they're looking at is either a completely fuel cell powered vehicle or a hybrid po uh, powered vehicle. When we talk about a hybrid powered vehicle, we have an IC engine, which is coupled with a fuel cell. So what we do is using the flue gas from the IC engine, you power the chemical reaction in which onboard hydrogen is produced. So this is one way that is being looked at. So of course, uh, if we go for uh, solar-based water splitting, you require very high amount of energy for that purposes. So there are various other chemical reactions that are being looked at, uh, which is called as uh, reforming reaction, be it methane, uh, methane reforming, methanol reforming. So these require actually lesser energy, and the yield of hydrogen is very high. But obviously, the drawback of these reactions is that you have CO, CO2, methane are not being produced. Uh, I mean, of course, higher hydrocarbons will produce methane. Methane reforming will have CO, CO2. So we'll have to have a uh, process to remove CO, CO2 first, and then send pure hydrogen to the fuel cell. So this is one r and that's going on. But onboard hydrogen production is one aspect that's being looked into right now. I just want to ask. Who is we? Uh, you know, I mean, that was my PhD research also. <laughs> so, yeah, but otherwise it's being looked at, uh, actually it's being looked at by 
uh, Toyota. Uh, so these are some of the companies. Okay. Uh, let me build on that point very quickly. She, so she's saying instead of taking hydrogen, bringing it to a vehicle, pumping it in, which, by the way, is at a high cost. It's got to be 5 or 10,000 PSI. It's got to be compressed, then it's got to be chilled because the compression heats it, blah, blah, blah. It adds a lot of cost to it. So what she's saying is produce the hydrogen on board. Okay, I just want to clarify that point. And by the way, I'm going to say one thing. Uh, if you do it with ammonia, you have no pollution because ammonia will disintegrate into hydrogen and nitrogen just like that. And then the nitrogen is fine. Okay, somewhere you had there and then Rajneesh. Yeah, so I'd like to, whatever he said, I agree to it, uh, to a certain extent that for industries, that's okay. But if it is for vehicles, say that, do we have enough space for vehicles like to just accommodate an electrolyzer or a solar panel and then a fuel cell in a vehicle and then put it there? How do we accommodate that? So when you say that, how can we manage without uh, like having hydrogen economy or having things that you want to fuel a vehicle, like the hydrogen is a fuel for the vehicle. How do we transport fuel to that vehicle, say that? If it's an industry that's understood, what you said is correct. But for a vehicle, how do you do that? Yeah, not hydrogen cannot be a one-stop shop to solve all the global problems. Focus on the problems that hydrogen can solve right now, right? And then as you develop your, you know, uh, you know high-speed transport uh, vehicles based on hydrogen, and uh, where hydrogen is in situ produced in the vehicle, clearly not through solar, because you'll need a ton of more solar to produce that, right? So, you, you know, that's a solvable problem once you, when, when you get there. Until then, focus on your steel, cement. You know, it's anyway 25% of carbon emissions are coming from cement. Your steel plant produces so much carbon that it's worthwhile solving those two big problems which are right now uh, using hydrogen, which is in situ, Atmanirbar, can be produced right here in India. You don't need to go anywhere to buy China for, for solar panels, right? Do that, right? Yeah, I guess what Max talked about works for blue hydrogen, not for green hydrogen. What he's talking about mostly what Preeti yesterday talked about, that you can do underground coal gasification, produce hydrogen in situ. So for all blue hydrogen kind of work, what Max told about works quite well because you don't have to really transport it. But then when you're talking about green hydrogen, then you will have to have this storage option. Otherwise, you don't have uh, sunlight 24 hour or uh, you don't have the option to basically use the hydrogen produced. You can do it in the morning, but in evening during the evening time, night time, you can't do that. So blue hydrogen, what you said, perfect uh, works perfectly. Yeah, and for cement, I think the actual number of cement, uh, uh, CO2 emission from cement is only 7% of total, not 25%. 7% roughly from cement industry and roughly 7% to 8% from steel industry. That's correct. But yeah, so 25% uh, is little uh, high. So it's probably 25% of industrial. Uh, let me give you a break. Yeah, maybe 25% of, 25 of industrial. 25% of industrial. But the major, major CO2 emission source are still electricity production and you have to worry about that. How to basically make that... Uh, smaller in no. terms of overall the, the other way to look at it is in terms of per capita emissions in india right uh, if you look at the per capita emissions in india i mean there's quite a quite low yeah nice nice low uh, chart where the low income category is at 2 tons per uh, you know uh, per per annum per per person right whereas the high income category is already at 10 so this is this is we need this to focus on cutting that down and the right way to do that is probably not hydrogen but evs yeah, so they, right. that brings another angle which people don't talk about is the equality. So those who are not producing uh, CO2, we need why, to bring they, should them up for why we need they should pay for it? Those who are exactly. producing, they should pay for it. So yeah, Correct. that is another angle which I think we can discuss. With. Okay, so the last comment was, don't do hydrogen, do EV. Okay, <laughs> let me make one, when EV first came out, they said, where is the electricity coming from? How clean is the electricity? You stuck with the same problem. Okay, uh, so uh, there are, I like to say there's no form of energy without a problem. Okay, it's just a question of pick your poison, okay, is, is the way it goes. Okay, uh, you, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just to add to the same point you're saying, right? So EV without PV doesn't make sense, <coughs> right? So you, you put the solar where you're, at least the charging stations need to be solarized, where the energy is coming from solar, at least most of it. Then you have a charging stations built on solar, and that way your additional energy requirement is not going to build more coal plants or more peak power plants. So, charging stations being solar, 
in, okay, I, I'm going to tell you some. So that means that every petrol station which now converted to charging station has to have sun ability. Uh, difficult. It goes back to Vasu's point that you know you better to do it at, at big location. So I just want to give a give a plug to Ashok Jindalwala's what he's been proselytizing for years, which is the battery swap. Okay, if you've got a battery swap model, you can charge it anywhere. Okay, and you can charge it under any conditions. Uh, charging is much easier and at certain temperatures and so forth and so on. So anyway, I want to give a quick uh, uh, plug to battery swapping as a concept uh, for addressing some of these points. Uh, who, did, who, yes. A dean going to speak about science? <laughs> So, so let me let me start by saying let me take a layman perspective. The dean working in systems engineering, so systems engineering perspective, and the chemical engineer, right? So I, I keep hearing uh, here this is the best, that is the best, and that won't work, this won't work. I don't think there is one solution right now, right? As chemical engineers, what do we do? We take the system from one steady state to another steady state. We have transitions. We have to figure out what is the path to go from here to there. So I don't know what this discussion is all about. Is it about the final steady state? Is it about tomorrow? <laughs> is it about day after? So it's so so the clear idea is that you are somewhere. First, figure out what is the most ideal final steady state, which I don't think there is any conclusion here. Someone says hydrogen, someone says something else, someone says why hydrogen? Right? That itself is not clear. And it's not also clear how you would go from here to the final steady state. So I think if you want to really think about it and solve the problem, first think about what might be, and that again, again, working in systems engineering and data science and so on, there are probabilities of success for everything. So you might say this is my final steady state and there is a 90% probability maybe you are right. Okay, so you have to do that planning and that's where we are very poor. I think we say there is a hydrogen evangelist, there is a battery swap evangelist and they will say this is the way to do it. They will never come together and then say well, all of these fit into a pattern and we have to think about what are the transition points, what will we do two years down the line, what will we do four years down the line and what will we do 20 years down the line. I think that kind of thinking is what we should foster, I think. Just as a layman, outsider perspective. See, here's the thing. Preeti already gave me the two-minute warning two minutes ago, okay? <laughs> and here's Professor Raghu, knowing this, <laughs> gets the last word in, okay? Uh, but, uh, but I'm going to ask you a question. What is this all about? This is about having fun and maybe learning something. That's it. Thank you.